Obviously, migration is an important issue or we wouldn't even have a channel dedicated to it. But you know what else is important? Gender. So what are we doing today? We're talking about migration and gender. Hi, my name is Melissa Siegel. I'm a professor of migration studies and this is a channel about all things migration. So let's get right into it. All right, so the first thing we need to do is talk about what is sex, right? So sex is the classification of a person as having female, male, and or intersex characteristics. So um, while infants are usually assigned the sex of male or female at birth based on the appearance of their external anatomy alone, the person's sex is actually a combination of a range of bodily sex characteristics, okay? So this is really about physical characteristics. Now, what is gender? So gender refers to the characteristics of a woman, men, um, boys and girls that are really socially constructed. So this includes norms, behaviors, and roles associated with being a woman, a man, a girl, or a boy, as well as the relationships within each other. And, um, you know, these are also social constructs and gender really varies from society to society and can change over time or what is acceptable or what is considered um, different genders. What's also important to understand though is that gender is hierarchical and it can and often does produce inequalities that can intersect with other social and economic inequalities. So we do often see gender-based um, discrimination that can also intersect with other factors of discrimination or other issues or characteristics that we can see gender discrimination based on, things like ethnicity or socioeconomic status or disabilities or age or demographic location, gender identity and orientation, of course, amongst other things. And this coming together of these lots of different characteristics is known as intersectionality, right? So all the things that I just mentioned are things that come from the World Health Organization and things that the World Health Organization also discusses in a 2022 paper, which of course I will link in the description below. Now let's get right to bringing gender and migration together, right? So the real purpose of this video. So according to the International Organization for Migration, gender influences reasons for migrating, who migrates and to where, how people migrate and the networks they use, opportunities and resources available at destinations and relations with the country of origin. Additionally, risks, vulnerability, and needs are also shaped in large part by someone's gender. And this often also varies drastically for different groups. So the roles, the expectations, relationships, and power dynamics associated with being a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl, or whether one identifies as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or intersex significantly affects all the aspects of the migration process and can also be affected in new ways by migration. So you can see that migration and gender are highly intersecting with each other. Now, of course, there are a number of key concepts additionally that we can talk about. One of them is the feminization of migration. So if you want to hear more about this, I've got an entire video on the channel specifically devoted to the feminization of migration. And you can check that out here. I'll also link it, of course, in the description below. But very quickly, what is the feminization of migration? So one thing is that we see more women migrating today than we've seen in the past. But of course, that also is because we have a larger um, population today than we have also had in the past. So where the feminization of migration also comes in and where we see it playing a more important role is really based on kind of the quality of migration or the reasons for migration. So what does that mean? Nowadays, we see that women are migrating more and more in their own right. They are migrating for their own labor reasons, for example. They are going to countries and migrating for work themselves. And this is less attached to other types of family migration. So women are not only just following a spouse or following a parent abroad anymore, they're actually migrating in their own right. So very quickly, that's kind of what the feminization of migration is talking about. 
Now, what's also quite interesting is how migration is often gendered. So we know, of course, that we generally have a gender selective demand for labor in certain sectors nowadays. So we see that, you know, women are often recruited for jobs in the domestic sphere, in house cleaning, in um, the care sector. So caring for children, caring for elderly, also often in the healthcare sector, where we see, for example, more men generally being being attracted to or recruited for jobs, for example, in the construction sector. Now, of course, men and women can work in both sectors, but we see that they are often highly gendered, and these are not the only sectors like that. What we can also see if we look at um, the gendering of migration, you can also see that um, women are much more likely to come from and to migrate to certain countries than other countries, right? The same is to be said for men. So here, what you can see very quickly is this is specifically just for migrant workers here, and it is broken down by males and female migrant workers. And you can see where these migrants are actually going. So to low income countries, to lower middle income countries, to upper middle income countries, and to high income countries. So in general, we do see that more migrants are going to high income countries than to other countries. And we see that actually for both genders. Now, if we look specifically at the regions and the countries in the world today of where migrants are going, specifically for migrant workers, you can see that women are much more likely to go to certain regions than to other regions. So women are much more likely to go to North America, Northern, Southern, and Western Europe than, for example, to the Arab states, where you see a higher proportion of migrants in the Arab states being men. And you can see a whole breakdown here, but you can see very clearly that um, migration to certain regions is often quite gendered. Now, I really like this quote because I think that it really nicely summarizes how migration and gender are often interlinked. So we see here expectations and gender norms strongly influence it, the decision to migrate. So depending on the country that people are coming from, especially the families they're coming from, the gender norms um, that are pervasive in that society, this can strongly influence not only the original decision to migrate and the ability to even migrate, but also where to migrate and under what conditions to migrate. So I think all of those things are quite important to understand. Now, let me just give you a few very gendered aspects of migration, just to give you a few examples of how we see the gendering of migration, right? This is not an exhaustive list, just a few examples. So we often think of the migration of men as being, you know, highly positive for men, as them having um, a lot of autonomy, a lot of ability to go where they want to, do what they want, having a lot more decision making maybe than women do in some parts of the world. But, you know, everything is not perfect for men. And I do think that one very specifically gendered aspect is how men are perceived or seen in countries of destination. Now, when compared with women in countries of destination, on average, men are often seen or perceived as more threatening on the labor market. So maybe they're perceived as being more competition. They're also seen as being physically more threatening. So they're seen as people who maybe will cause crimes or do violent things. Now, of course, the evidence for that is very, very lacking, but in general, men compared to women are often perceived as more of a physical threat. And the third way that we often see men being considered as a threat is actually on the marriage or mating market. So men are often seen as competition or a threat to being able to partner with local women, and they're often seen as competition for local men. So I do think it's important to, to recognize that compared to women, men often are perceived as more threatening, meaning that often women might be more easily accepted in countries of origin. Now, of course, women have a whole other set of issues that they often have to face. It is absolutely true that women face a higher risk of gender-based violence, um, including trafficking and sexual exploitation and forced marriages. Now, of course, men can also be trafficked, but it is more likely that women are trafficked for sexual exploitation purposes than men. 
We also see that you know women are often represented in sectors where they make less money upon migration. Um, they are definitely disproportionately represented in lower paid occupations and in the informal economy, such as in domestic work or care work. And human rights abuses are often also ripe in these in these sectors. So. It's important to also recognize that. And in many areas around the world, we also see that we have higher rates of inactivity in the labor market amongst women compared to men. Now, we shouldn't only talk about men and women. It's important to note that you know trans and non-binary um, groups of people, more generally LGBTQI plus people, also are often very vulnerable within the migration experience in their countries of origin, but also in their countries of destination and in transit. And they are also much more prone to sexual exploitation and violence. Now, a couple of other just gendered aspects of migration that I think are interesting to highlight is that um, in general, women are more likely to receive remittances regardless of the sex of the remitter. So no matter if the person who is sending the money is a man or a woman, a woman is more likely to be a recipient of that money. And we do know that remittances have led to an increase in women both running and owning businesses. Now. What's also interesting to see is how um, women and men often use the money, the remittances that are sent back to the house for slightly differently. So we see that when women receive remittances, family welfare improves and the health and the education of the family's children also often improve. So in general, we see that when women are receiving the money, family welfare goes up. We also see that specifically migrant women's remittances also help to improve the family's well-being um, with women again directly often specifically remitting for things like health care and education and we see that this can be extremely helpful for the family and in some cases we see that the remittances of women also go into helping um, increase the education level of girls in the household. Now, when both men and women send remittances, and when men and women both receive remittances, of course, this can be extremely helpful, extremely positive for the household that receives those. We also have videos on this channel on the effects of migration and of remittances on the countries of origin and the families who receive them. So if you're interested in that, you can find that here. And of course, I'll make sure to link it in the description down below. But now if we look specifically at men, when men receive remittances, we see that generally the family's assets um, are more likely to increase. So it seems that men and women are investing these remittances, again, on average, in slightly different things. So women invested a bit more in health and education of the household members, where men are generally more likely to invest it in assets in the household. Now, another interesting thing is that while women are often making less money abroad, and maybe also because of that, maybe send less remittances in absolute terms, we actually see that women often remit a higher proportion of their incomes than do male migrants. Um, so that's quite interesting. So even though they might be making less money, they are often sending a higher proportion of their income home. If we also look at women compared to men, they generally show more stability and frequency in sending home remittances and are more likely to remit when unexpected shocks occur. So their remittances are often serving as a form of informal insurance. Now, of course, this can be the case for men also, but we see this a little bit more in the case of women. Now, if we go back to discussing maybe something that is a bit less um, nice to discuss, so gender-based violence, which of course we know is an issue, there are some very specific categories of migrants that are more likely to be particularly prone to gender-based violence. So uh, we know that female refugees and asylum seekers are more prone to gender-based violence. They are subject to violence like forced prostitution, raped, forced circumcision or sterilization, or also other things during their journey, as well as on arrival in the country of destination. 
So we generally know also that female domestic migrant workers are particularly vulnerable um, to violence and to specifically gender-based violence, not only in their country of destination, but also along their migration journeys. And part of this intersectionality of what also makes them more vulnerable is that they are often also irregular or doing irregular work. Now, a third category that is also more likely to have to face gender-based violence is LGBTQI migrants and refugees who often face stigmatization, discrimination, and violence, not only in their countries of origin or where they came from, but again, often in transit and sometimes um, also in destination countries. So all of these things, you know, give us give us some pause to consider which groups are most vulnerable and maybe also which groups need to be more targeted by policy. So now we've seen a number of areas where you know migration is very gendered. Uh, we've seen a number of ways in which not only migration, but also remittances, but also gender-based violence amongst migration, where these two things are intersecting. I hope this was interesting and useful for you. If you have questions or comments, of course, feel free to leave them in the comments section. If you found this useful, please definitely give it a thumbs up and feel free to share this video around and make sure you hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the videos we upload every week on different migration issues. And I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.